We have on the phone line right now, Lord Christopher Monckton. But before I go to him, I want to tell you that right now, for every $329 you spend on food with eFoods Direct, you'll get a free 24-day supply, the Patriot Pack, plus free shipping. That's a huge savings. Not even counting the shipping, you save $190. That's a limit of just 10 per order. And you can get that at eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex or at 800 409 5633. Now, it's a real pleasure to talk to Lord Christopher Monckton. I'm looking forward to it. He's a, a true Renaissance man. Uh, he's not only a businessman, he's been a newspaper editor, an inventor, a classical architect, and he has been a special advisor to Margaret Thatcher as prime minister. One of the things that is not usually talked about about uh, Lord Monckton is that in 1999, as part of his businessman aspect, I guess, he created and published the Eternity Puzzle, which is a geometric puzzle that involved tilting a dodecahedron with 209 irregularly shaped polygons called polydrafters. He offered a million-dollar prize, and after a year and a half, it was won by a couple of Cambridge mathematicians. But by that time, he had sold a half million puzzles. He did it again in 2007, but after four years, nobody had solved his puzzle. Well, you know, he's a real puzzle solver, and he's going to help us solve this puzzle, this uh, false narrative of uh, global warming, which is something of a scam. And, you know, kind of like uh, people have said of Las Vegas, just a city that's been built on the backs of people who don't understand math. Well, you know, global warming and carbon taxes are a burden that are going to be put on the backs of people that don't understand what's going on, don't understand how to look at a, uh, a chart and see a trend, don't understand how to honestly analyze a trend analysis. Lord Monckton, how are you doing? It's a pleasure to talk it's to you. It's very good to hear you. I'm in fine fettle. I've just been watching with great amusement the hearing the Senate has just held on the, uh, held on the subject of whether global warming is really happening. And the truth is, of course, it hasn't now been happening for somewhere between 15 and 17 years. There hasn't been any global warming. And that is beginning to give the usual suspects something to worry about. They've been very arrogant until now. They've said there's a consensus. And of course, they fiddled the consensus as well. A paper came out in a journal which I suspect was created just so that they could publish this paper because no proper peer reviewed journal would ever have published it. And the paper claimed that 97% of nearly 12,000 extracts from scientific papers um, supported the consensus that more than half the warming of the last. Uh, sort of 50 years was caused by us, but in fact, a closer analysis of the paper shows it wasn't 97%, it was 0.3% of the abstracts that actually agreed with that consensus. So they're still fiddling everything they can fiddle, but the temperature is not rising as fast as they wanted it to. In fact, it's not really rising at all. Sea level for the last eight years has been rising at a rate equivalent to less than two inches a century. So, frankly, the scare is now over. Will somebody please tell the Democrats? Absolutely. You know, we went to they had the American Meteorological Society had their meeting here in Austin this year, and we covered it yeah. for Infowars. And it was pretty amazing to see, just as you talked about, they love to do things like appeal to authority or appeal to the fact that they have this many scientists from this prestigious university who sign on to their theory. And it's like, show me the data. Show me the facts. And you've got a great presentation where you basically go through and you look at it. It's a very, we just had that up on the screen there. If you look at temperatures, uh, there, it's quite a noisy graph. And you have to draw a trend line through that to take a, a you know, sample of it. I mean, we have uh, the temperature variation is all over the place. But when you honestly draw the trend line through it, you see that it is, there is no global warming going on. You do a great job of pointing that out in your presentations. Well, that's very kind of you. In fact, I'm now doing a monthly graph which shows the predictions which the UN's climate panel, for which I'm an expert reviewer, is about to make. It's uh, just in a couple of months' time, they'll be producing their fifth of their five yearly multi-thousand page collections of scientific rubbish about global warming. <laughs> and in, in that particular document that's just about to come out, which of course I've read because I reviewed it for them, um, they have made predictions about how fast the world should be warming at the moment. 
and it should be warming at a rate equivalent to about two and a third Celsius degrees or kind of five to six Fahrenheit degrees every century. But in fact, it's not doing that. It's not warming at all. So they've got a big problem. And what I'm doing every month now is publishing the latest monthly temperature record from the satellites of the University of Alabama at Huntsville and remote sensing systems. Emitted. I take the average of those and plot the graph. Then I calculate the trend line. There's a standard statistical formula that I use for doing that. And it is at the moment declining very slightly. It's not really a significant decline, but it is declining. Whereas the forecast temperatures of course are heading upwards because they've just predicted that our adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere will have about twice as much effect on the temperatures as in fact it has been having over the last 50 years and with the sun now going into something of a hissy fit it's gone into decline really um, it's beginning to look as though the real worry is going to be about whether we're going to get global cooling in the next couple of years right. certainly and possibly even for the next couple of decades that's right as, as many meteorologists and other scientists have pointed out and as common sense would dictate the thing that really drives the weather and global warming is solar activity. You know, that's the thing that really correlates to it. One of the things we noticed at the Meteorological Society's meeting was that uh, meteorologists are very much interested in doing exactly what you're doing, and that is taking a lot of measurements. And yes. they were distinguished from the climatologists because, you know, the meteorologists, they're looking at short-term predictions. So they're going out and they're taking measurements here, measurements there, and uh, then they're testing that against their models. Climatologists, on the other hand, they're looking at such long-term scale that they can go out and they can create these open-ended models, which, of course, they can't really test or verify. Right. Well, and you, well we can't really test or verify. They would like you to think that, wouldn't right. they? Right. But they do also make medium-term predictions over the next 30 or 40 years, and it's those medium-term predictions that I'm testing. They are saying that over those 40 years, there'll be a more or less straight-line increase in global temperatures at a rate equivalent, if it carried on for 100 years, to 2.33 Celsius degrees. That's their central estimate. Now, that we can test. Is it or is it not rising at a rate equivalent to 2.33 Celsius per century? Now, the answer is that it never has done that ever since we've been taking records back since 1850. We've been doing it in the UK, compiling a global temperature record. And the fastest rate of warming since 1850 occurred between roughly 1974 and 2006, if you take the trend on that period, then the rate is about two Celsius per century equivalent. But of course, if you take the period from, shall we say, 1996 until the present, then in fact you've got either a flat line or you've got, if anything, a slight decline in temperature. The, the, the truth is that it is no longer warming as they had predicted, and they do not know why. But of course, anyone who has done what you have done and what the meteorologists at the American Meteorological Society have done, and you look at the changes in the activity of the sun over the last hundreds of years or tens of years, it doesn't matter what period, it's the sun that's the major influence. And very interestingly, in Hamburg, just a few months ago, a Dr. Murray Salby, who's the professor of climate sciences at Macquarie University in Sydney, or rather he was until his results became so inconvenient that they fired him <laughs> uh, for no good reason that anyone can see. Um, he came out with a very interesting finding that if you take not just the day-to-day -day fluctuations of the sun, but you take what's called the time integral of the sun, and that means you kind of add up how much extra heat the sun is pouring in or how much extra heat it isn't pouring in and you look at it as a kind of bucket if you like where you're pouring in heat at the top and then heat's going back out to outer space or into the sea at the other direction and he said if you take that time integral as it's called then solar activity really explains just about all of the warming and cooling that we've seen over various periods going back 10,000 years or just going back over the last few dozens of years. It doesn't matter what period you take. Yeah, absolutely. And he's, applied, and he's used a, a real rocket science mathematical technique called Fourier analysis to mm -hmm. do this. 
And yeah. interestingly, there are others in Australia and elsewhere now doing the same analysis without realizing that he's already working on it as well. well and you I know. think what you're going to find is a series of papers coming out in the peer-reviewed literature over the next few years, really more or less proving that it is the sun that's chiefly responsible for fluctuations in global temperature and that CO2 at best is a bit part player. Absolutely. Now, we've talked a lot about the science, but when we come back from the break, I want to go over the economic consequences for people because, you know, this is not just an academic or scientific debate. You know, we could have that debate and it would be very interesting, but this is something that has real world consequences. We're talking about something, as you've pointed out, that's a third of the global GDP that's being proposed for these carbon taxes. It's amazing transfer of wealth, the largest transfer of wealth to private individuals that we've ever seen. This is something, a scam that is very similar, in my opinion, to the Federal Reserve scam that we have here with our central bank, but on a far larger scale, on a global scale that affects everyone on the planet, especially those of us in the Western countries from which they want to transfer the wealth. So we want to cover that in the very next segment. I want to talk about the real dollars and cents effect of this and how it's going to affect everyone and why you should be concerned about this global warming debate, why you should also be armed with the science, as Lord Moncton has pointed out, so you can have this debate, so they can inform politicians and your neighbors about what this scam is really about. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. I had tried everything. I'd cut back the amount of food I was eating. I was lifting weights and jogging, but nothing was working. My body was literally starving for minerals and trace elements as well as key vitamins. And as soon as I had that, I immediately could eat half of what I was eating previously and be satisfied. Now, there are hundreds of great products at InfoWarsTeam.com, but I want to point out the three that have helped me lose 37 pounds in just two months. Products like Beyond Tangy Tangerine, Pollen Burst, and Rebound. When I started taking the Tangy Tangerine and other products every day, I lost more than 37 pounds in just two months. Now that's results. I want to challenge my listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com and to order just three of their products, and you will see the changes in the way you look, feel, and in your appetite almost immediately. Start your journey to health and wellness today. InfoWarsTeam.com. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, here filling in for Alex Jones, and we have live on the phone Lord Christopher Monckton. And no, this is not the end, in spite of what the climate alarmists want to tell us, this is not the end. And we've been talking about the bad science and some of the issues with the uh, data that's been given to people that policy is actually being based on with Lord Christopher Monckton. But in this segment, I want to talk about the real dollars and cents consequences about this. And not only just dollars and cents, but real life consequences. You know, we're all told that uh, everything is going to melt and all the cities are going to be overrun with water. And so this is a matter of life and death. Well, you know, it really is a matter of life and death when you can't have access to cheap power. It is the access to energy. Available, affordable access to energy is the best predictor of life expectancy as well as just creature comforts. Lord Moncton, can you lay this out for the audience exactly what's at stake here in terms of uh, global governance, in terms of this massive transfer of wealth that is being proposed with these carbon taxes? Yes, this is the biggest transfer of wealth in human history, mm -hmm. from the poor to the rich, from mm -hmm. the little guy to the big guy, from the governed to those who govern them. And it's a kind of Robin Hood in reverse. There is no scientific basis for it, and there's no economic basis for it either. And what I'd like to do is just take, as an example, the Sanders Boxer proposed carbon tax. They failed to get cap and trade through. They couldn't get that through uh, the Congress. Now they're trying to flog this dead horse by rebranding it as a, as a carbon tax, rather like the one in Australia. But here are the figures on this, and if you've got a pencil and paper handy, you might like to write these down, because they, they are all mainstream science, mainstream figures, straight from the UN's climate panel, straight from Sanders and Boxer themselves. I am not making any of these figures up. I am just drawing from these figures the conclusions that they should have drawn if they had known enough climatology and economics to understand how daft their proposal is. So here goes. They're going to cut 
Carbon dioxide emissions in the United States with this tax, if they get away with it, which they won't, but let's pretend, by 11% over 10 years. Now that's over and above the amount at which it's falling anyway because more and more people are burning uh, cheap gas to deliver their power and gas emits half the amount of CO2 per BTU delivered uh, as coal. So that's why in the US, in fact, uh, carbon dioxide emissions almost uniquely in the Western world have been falling more or less throughout the last decade or so. But anyway, they're saying they're going to increase that rate of fall by 10.9%. But the point is that the US only accounts for 17.5% of all uh, global carbon emissions. So even if the Sanders Boxer tax were to succeed as they want it to, and they really have no scientific or economic basis for assuming that it will, then less than 2% of global CO2 emissions would be remitted over that 10-year period. That, in turn, would reduce the CO2 concentration, which the UN's climate panel would expect to be 422 parts per million by volume. That would reduce it to from 422 to 421.5. So not much of a change there. Mm -hmm. That in turn means that the CO2 radiative forcing, which is the effect which eventually causes warming, would fall by 0 0.006 watts per square meter. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to measure it. That in turn means that the projected business as usual um, anthropogenic forcing uh, which would have been 0.467 watts per square meter, will come down by only 1.3%. So you can hardly measure any of this. And that means that the cost of abating uh, all of the radiative forcing that, that would happen worldwide over the 10-year period of the tax from now until 2023, if everyone worldwide adopted the Sanders Boxer tax and you used that to try to stop global warming, that would mean it would cost 11.5% of global GDP. So 11.5% of everything we make and sell just to reduce the amount of warming that would otherwise happen over the next 10 years. Well, we're not, yeah, not going to feel that uh, change in climate, but we certainly are going to feel that change in our lifestyle in terms of That's the amount right. of money that we but have. That is going to be massive. The here's the full absurdity of it. Well, we're going to cover that. We've got a break coming up. We'll get right back to that. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about methane levels, the trans-Russian pipeline, and as you put it, Lord Moncton, gas Putin. <laughs> we'll talk about all that coming up in the next segment. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now will remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because Today, we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter. And in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex and we have on the line Lord Christopher Monckton. And we're talking about global warming. Now, the global warming people who advocate that this is being caused by man-made CO2 and not by changes in solar activity, those people call us skeptics. We call them alarmists. And, you know, a skeptic is someone who is going to say, uh, prove it to me. And that's basically the way science has always worked. Uh, show me the data. And that's exactly what we're talking about. The data that they're showing us is data that has been cooked, that has been fudged, that has been cherry-picked. But, you know, they're joining that with a compliant media. And that's one of the things that you should 
check out State of Mind, the documentary. It's at Infowars.com. You can also buy it at Infowarsstore.com. And that will explain to you exactly how the schools are a large part of bringing the population a long line of whatever catastrophe the government is pushing at any given moment to try to uh, expand its power, to expand its reach. And this global warming alarmism is actually a way of expanding global governance and transferring wealth. And we were just talking to uh, Lord Moncton about that transfer of wealth. Lord Moncton, can we put a dollar figure on this? What's this going to cost per person? I, I saw you uh, covered that on one of your uh, presentations. Well, that's right. It is very, very expensive indeed. I mean, if we just take this, this carbon tax, I mean, that's going to cost even if the warming happens at the rate they predict, and even if it costs as much to make it go away as they predict, it's going to cost $13,000 per head. But, you see, you have to multiply that by about three, because the warming isn't happening at the rate they predict. So you're really looking at getting on for $40,000 per head, just over the next 10 years. And that's per head of the entire global population. Now, where is a starving person in Africa or Asia or South America going to find forty thousand dollars from? Where's an American? Where's an American going to find that? <laughs> that's well, per that's, that's per that's head. A family of four, you know. You're... The streets of Austin, Texas, are paved with gold. Everybody in Austin, Texas, <laughs> can afford right. four thousand dollars over the next ten years, <laughs> but nobody else can. And so, right. of course, this is this is the extravagant absurdity of all this. And the figures I've just run through with you which show that even if the warming were going to happen at the rate that they say, and even if that would do as much damage as they say, and even if it would cost as much to make that damage go away, as they say, or just to adapt to it, as they say, then it would be eight times more expensive to try to stop the global warming today with measures of equivalent cost-effectiveness to the Sanders Boxer proposed tax, as it would be simply to let it happen, sit back, enjoy the sunshine, and pay the later and far lesser cost of adapting to such of its consequences as might be adverse. Right, now the, the government always tries to do a, a, a crisis. You know, they're always looking for crises to uh, do things. And as you but pointed if, out- even if there is a crisis, mm -hmm. the fact is that if, by the time you've allowed for the fact that it isn't happening at the rate, they say. It's happening at about one third of the rate, they say, in the last 15 years, not even at all. If you allow for that, then it's 20 times, and I'm not talking about 20%, it's 20 times more expensive to have Sanders boxers taxes worldwide to stop the global warming happening than it is just to let it happen and pay the cost of letting it happen and adapting to its adverse consequences, even if it's going to happen, uh, if the consequences are as expensive to deal with as they're trying to say they are. That's, that's right. how absurd these numbers are. Yeah, that's and right. all this is mainstream economics, it's mainstream calculations, mainstream climatology. None of this is acting on assumptions other than the assumptions that they themselves are using. And they just haven't bothered to do the math because, as you rightly said earlier, this is another Federal Reserve scam. It's not about addressing global warming. It is about making the rich even richer while the poor get even poorer. And you and I are against that. That's right. You know, it, it's like I say, and they always like to use a crisis to move things along. That's what they did with the TARP bailout. They pulled in a lot of uh, congressmen and senators and said, look, you need to give this massive amount of money to the banks right away or there's going to be rioting in the streets. We've got a lot of mortgages that are underwater. We need to help these people. That money never left the banks. Uh, none of that yeah. stuff happened. So they're basically trying to create a crisis. They want to, if they, if they don't have a crisis that they can use for their purposes, they'll manufacture a crisis. And that's what we see happening here. Talk a little bit about Climate Gate. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of what happened there at East Anglia University. We had a revelation of uh, some data, I believe it was in 2009. We had uh, a thousand emails leaked and basically they were talking about hiding the data. And then it was repeated again a couple of years later. We had, uh, I think it was 2011, we had 5,000 emails leaked. Uh, I was part of a, a team that was trying to get uh, access to Michael Mann's uh, emails at the University of Virginia because a lot of those emails were back and forth to Michael Mann, but uh, so far that we've not been able to, to get access to that. They've hidden those. Why are they hiding that data? 
Well, they're hiding the data and they're hiding the emails because the emails that have become public show that a small, malevolent clique of bad scientists on the very far left politically, such as Michael Mann, were deliberately tampering with the data, destroying data, fiddling their results, so as to pretend that it was a whole lot uh, warmer today than it was a thousand years ago, when very nearly all the papers in the scientific literature that have done this by reference to actual measurement, which you were talking of earlier, rather than playing around with models as Michael Mann did, those papers that do it by measurement show that it was very likely a great deal warmer a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, four thousand years ago, and also between six thousand and ten thousand years ago than it is today. So today's temperatures are not exceptional. And they had to uh, change that. In fact, in 1995, Ken Overpeck, one of the people who features in these emails, and one of the bad scientists who've been bending the data, uh, wrote to a good scientist from whom I got the story. And he said, we have to abolish the medieval warm period. Not we have to check whether it was there or how big it was <laughs> or whether it was global. No, we have to abolish it. And right. so they did. That was the significance of Michael Mann's graph. And then somebody at the University of East Anglia was so horrified by this that they released all the emails going back 10 years uh, between the University of East Anglia and these other scientists all over the world to the BBC. But of course, the BBC is in the tank for this garbage. Oh, its yeah. pension fund is heavily invested in so-called green, so-called investments. And so it wasn't going to release these. And the person in the BBC who sent, was sent this data, these, these emails, who was one of their environment correspondents, didn't do anything with it. He sat on it. And so eventually, the emails were released via a Russian website. And then uh, the police went round bullying. They didn't dare try to bully me, but they did bully some of my friends here in the UK uh, to find out whether we had anything to do, do with what they were calling the theft of these emails. But hang on, this wasn't theft. These were paid scientists at public institutions, chiefly in the United States and Britain. We are the taxpayers. We pay for them to do this research and talk to each other about it. And so these emails, along with all their results and their data and their models, ought to be public property. Anyway. Exactly. Exactly. That's our point. I was at the American Tradition Institute and... The people there, uh, Ken Cuccinelli, the Attorney General in Virginia, and others yeah. were saying, "This, these are emails that were that were conducted by Michael Mann as he was yeah. employed by the University of Virginia at taxpayer expense, producing information and so-called science that is now forming the basis of policy. So we need to be able to have full transparency, full disclosure. And yet, what we see coming out of that is the same thing we're seeing with the Snowden leaks." Rather than, right. rather than going after it and looking at it and saying, okay, what is this leaked data showing us? You know, is there something dishonest, criminal going on here? Is there a conspiracy going on here? Instead of looking at that, they attack Snowden. They say, well, how did these leaks come up? And, and as you mentioned, instead of looking at the actual data and saying these people are conspiring to craft a story uh, to, to suit themselves, they're cherry picking the data. Rather than do that, they want to know where did that leak come from? That's, that's the extraordinary thing. I mean, I've written to the police a couple of times about this and said, look, there's fraud going on here, and it's mm -hmm. going on on an enormous scale, and it's not a matter of scientific debate. They are tampering with the evidence. I've given them a couple of very clear examples of where the evidence has been deliberately bent. And Ken Cuccinelli is being very slow off the mark here. He is still faffing around trying to get emails which man is never going to deliver and the right. university won't either because once this fraud comes out in public they're all going to go down the university of virginia is going to get closed down as is penn state they'll mm -hmm. close the whole university down yeah. because they've tried to cover up this fraud but that's what it is that's right simply bogus science that's but right ken cuccinelli has if he did but understand it enough evidence already to convict those who were responsible for, and I'm going to use this word bluntly, fabricating that bogus hockey stick graph. That graph is a fraud, 
and it is relatively easy to prove that it's a fraud. Mm -hmm. And I've often done this in front of um, audiences to see how they react. If, and these are just lay audiences. And you say, right, here's the evidence. Here is what they did. Now, if you were a jury and they did this, would you convict them of fraud? And the answer <laughs> is yes, the jury would convict them of fraud. And That's so right. Cuccinelli, if he wanted because he is a state's attorney general, he has a certain amount of credibility. If he were simply to bring a prosecution against those who fabricated that graph, then I can put him in touch with scientists who have done detailed analyses far beyond anything that I would be capable of doing, uh, expert scientists in this field, who will be able to demonstrate to him exactly how this was done, by whom it was done, and why it is fraudulent. And so, I just hope that he will do the, the sensible thing and just go in front of a grand jury, put these scientists I can put him in touch with on the witness stand and say to them, right, tell us what's been going on. The grand jury will be as horrified as I was when I sat down with the experts concerned and they told me how it had been done. It was and is a standing outrage. And it is, I think, only a matter of time. And if, if, if Ken Cuccinelli hasn't got the, what in English we should call the cojones to do this, then I think we're going to have to find another state's attorney general who is willing to bring these people to book. But one shouldn't home in only on them. Right. This is a widespread and connected series of major frauds, and the ClimateGate emails are the index to who is involved and what they've been up to. And uh, frankly, if uh, I were a, a wealthier man and had more time to devote to this, I would have a lot of these people in court and just say, hey, right, this is a fraud, the police will not do anything. Our serious fraud office, I've written to them, they uh, don't even write back, they just you get an automated acknowledgement saying they're not interested in investigating serious fraud if it's the government that's doing it. Absolutely. Uh, and, the pest of the private sector. And it, it's, uh, just another, it's just another measurement of the widespread corruption in government that people can get caught red-handed, you know, with these conspiring to deceive the public. Being caught red-handed with the way that they're, as you've pointed out in your presentations, the way they cherry-pick the starting points to kind of get the trend analysis that they want. They very carefully choose it. You have a, a great example of a, a sine wave, and you say, well, if I just look at this one portion of a sine wave, I can make it look as if uh, everything is declining, or every, uh, pick another portion, everything is increasing. So, you know, if you cherry-pick the data, which is what this climate gate stuff was all about, emails back and forth to each other to hide the decline. If you look at the text just from the very first one, and Alex was on this from the very beginning, but he's kind of, oh, yeah. as we showed this, uh, these old articles with Alex uh, standing in front of a, a blackboard of the video, he was on it from the very beginning, but the mainstream media was, like I said, compliant with this story, because why? Because it grows the government, and because any fraud, as you pointed out, that's done by the government, it's something that we really shouldn't look at. We need to just move along. There's no story here. That's right. I mean, in fact, when I worked at 10 Downing Street, I found this kind of corruption going on. <laughs> and I made sure that because I was where I could do something about it, people who tried that on did not get away with it. I investigated several scientific frauds that were going on at that time and had them stopped because the lies didn't work. They tried lying even to Downing Street, but it didn't work. And the trouble is that in government now, there are too few people who have any understanding of elementary mathematics or science. That's true. And so there, were, there were the senators having this big inquiry, but none of those senators, I've spoken to some of them, they're all good people, but none of them simply has enough of a scientific background to realize just what a monstrosity this global warming story is on three major fronts. First of all, even in theory, we wouldn't expect to see all that much in the way of global warming. Secondly, actually, it hasn't been occurring at anything like the rate that they've been predicting. And thirdly, even if it did, it's economically 10 to 100 times cheaper to let it happen and adapt to its adverse consequences than it is to do anything about it. Those are the hard, simple, central facts of this debate. And it's just regrettable 
that there are too few politicians who really understand enough science and enough economics to be able to put the two together and realize just what a, a fantasy and an absurdity all of this is. But here's the exciting bit, and I've said this to Alex, I'll say it to you, <laughs> that they've, the left, which now controls governments worldwide, it controls civil services, it controls the Supreme Court, it controls, of course, the media virtually wall to wall. Oh, yeah. They have made what is going to have proven to be a heroic, strategic mistake by nailing their red flag to the mast of the sinking ship global warming. And that rising sea level that they are seeing is not the sea rising, it's the good ship global warming sinking beneath them. Because <laughs> the science in the end cannot be controverted. Either it is going to warm at the rate that they predicted, or it is not. Those of us who have done the sums properly know that it isn't happening, we know that it isn't going to happen, we know why it isn't going to happen, and we know that even if it did happen, you'd be better off not doing anything about it and spending the money more usefully somewhere else. So we will not be surprised, but a lot of the fellow travellers on the left who, once they are told the party line, will parrot it without ever questioning whether it was right or wrong, are suddenly going to get a shock. Because you see, in most matters of politics. What happens is, that, you, know, you can argue it one way or the other, but on matters of science, it's not like that. Oh, yeah, there absolutely. is truth and there is everything else. And in truth, this global warming scare is a lie. It's the greatest lie ever told, as Professor Nicholas Myrna calls it. It's a very big, very costly lie, which is hugely beneficial to the governing class in most parts of the world. It's hugely damaging to the working class and the poorer classes in all parts of the world, particularly in the very poorest countries, who are not being allowed to develop the cheap fossil fueled electricity, which is the fastest way of lifting them out of poverty. And Absolutely. that's the fastest way of stabilizing their populations. Absolutely. The and it, and it's, a, it's a propaganda, it's a, an information war, it's a propaganda war, because even though they know this, and even though we can tell people this, it's really who can repeat a lie the most times can, can actually deceive the public. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this. We've got one more segment with Lord Christopher Monckton, so stay tuned. We're going to talk a little bit more about the massive impact of this proposed legislation. Johnny Appleseed was born during the Revolutionary War. He's not just a legend. And in more than five states, he introduced apples that had not even been grown in the colonies. Later, the seeds from plants he planted and cultivated and some of the varieties he developed spread across the United States. And it was Johnny Appleseed teaching the colonists and then the new Americans after we won independence the love of planting fruit trees that introduced that idea to North America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a revolutionary act to unplug from the television, to unplug from the computer and all the globalist propaganda and to go out in your backyard or your front yard or planters at your apartment or on the roof of the building where you live and to plant a garden. Become the Johnny Appleseed of your community with seeds from the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsStore.com. The simple act of planting fruits and vegetables and then tending them and taking care of them and then sharing them with friends and family is a revolutionary act against tyranny. The globalists, first and foremost, do not want us to be self-sufficient. The crony anti-free market capitalist, the fascist, are using socialism and collectivism to shut down societies. Stalin in Poland and in Ukraine and other areas starved on record more than 10 million people over five years by not letting them grow their own crops and collectivizing them. Mao killed between 65 million and 80 plus million people doing this same thing. The UN says they will use food as a weapon. They use genetic evil to attack the earth and major GMO companies have been caught going into growth belts around the world, even where GMO is illegal and planting seeds everywhere to infect the genetics of the original crops. Almost all of the thousands of varieties of Mexican corn has been infected. They are in a genetic war against everyone. That's why we have to get these seeds and not just plant them on our own gardens and not just give them as gifts to friends and family to plant spring and summer and fall gardens. I'm calling on you 
to go out into the green belts, to go out into the areas and plant secret gardens. No, not of marijuana, but of the hundreds and hundreds of incredible high quality uh, vegetables and herbs and fruit plants that are here. Lemons and oranges, the list goes on and on. They will grow, uh, plum trees, grape trees, they will grow almost everywhere in the U.S. We can literally, not just buying these products from InfoWarsStore.com, but from wherever you get them. This aggressive program literally just came to me one morning when I woke up about 4 a.m. realizing that we've got to counter their genetic war against us with original, real crops developed over eons on this planet. We have the lowest prices we bought it in the biggest bulk that some of these companies have ever seen to ship this directly to you from the InfoWars Command Center. We stand for life. We stand for liberty. We stand for self-sufficiency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com, click on the Seed Center, and as of taping this, we have the seven top respected brands. We intend to continue to do research and find other companies, other specialties, other varieties to really take action. The InfoWars Store Seed Center has the largest online selection of heirloom, non-GMO seeds. Check out these products from our newest supplier, Heirloom Organics. The Medicine Garden for a natural remedy. The Tea Garden that contains every important tea herb you can grow. Fruit lovers with 12 varieties. And the Tobacco Pack, additive and pesticide free. Join the gardening revolution today at InfoWarsStore.com. This is a revolutionary action we're asking you to take. Plant seeds everywhere today. Nurture them, bring them to fruit, and pass on the knowledge to others. Become human again. Discover your roots in the soil. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. <laughs> Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex Jones, and we have Lord Christopher Monckton on the phone from England, and he's been talking to us about this fraud being perpetrated on the public, on the world, called global warming and the supposed solution, carbon taxes or cap and trade or whatever they come up with at the moment to transfer wealth from us to a few people. Now, we were just, uh, Lord Monckton, we were... As I was pointing out, when we went to the American Meteorological Society, one of the things that really struck me was the information war that's being conducted there. There was one group that was uh, Soros-funded, and yeah. they were there, and they were trying to convince meteorologists that they had, first of all, they had graphs up, and it's like, you know, who, who do you believe uh, on global warming? And, of course, they believe uh, meteorologists. So they were trying to convince meteorolo meteorologists to be propagandists for their point of view. And what they were doing was appealing to the authority of people with uh, degrees at prestigious institutes or to the number of scientists that agreed with their position. But, of course, we've had countless instances throughout history where the majority of prestigious scientists agreed about something and were totally wrong. Yes, there was one yeah. that I mentioned in the U.S. Congress when I was giving testimony there a few years ago. And uh, I think it was uh, Henry Waxman said to me, he said at the end of the hearing, he said, I really prefer to follow Isaac Newton. And I said, but he got it wrong at the margin. <laughs> and Einstein corrected him. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't just believe in a consensus, however eminent. In fact, the argument from consensus was condemned 2,350 years ago by Aristotle as being a bogus argument, a logical fallacy. Exactly. And it was condemned again by the founder of the scientific method, Abu Ali ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Husayn ibn al-Husayn ibn al-Haytham. He was as proud of his lineage as I am of mine in 11th century Iraq, who said that the seeker after truth, that was his beautiful phrase for the scientist, doesn't put his faith in any mere consensus. Instead, he checks and checks and checks again because the road to the truth, said Al-Haytham, is long and hard. And that's the road we must follow. And just looking up to see who's got a PhD doesn't actually tell you whether that PhD is telling the truth because that's another logical fallacy. It's the fallacy of argument from reputation, the argumentum yes. ad vericundiam, as the medieval schoolmen were later to call it. So all of these arguments they're using are logical fallacies. Now, why then are they getting away with it? 
The answer is because they very carefully destroyed the education system first. Yes. From the Middle Ages until my own generation, and I was the last, we were taught not only grammar, but also logic. We were taught to recognize bogus arguments like those the left now trot out routinely, to recognize them five miles off. All of the major arguments in favor of the global warming scare are logical fallacies condemned as such and listed as such by Aristotle 2,350 years ago. But most people don't know this. Most of the left don't know it. They have so destroyed the education system, they themselves are not properly educated. Exactly. Along those lines, you're talking about how most of the congressmen can't understand how to look at a, uh, at a chart with a, that's pretty noisy and draw a trend line through it, honestly. So if they're, you know, they've taken that down, and at the same time, they have created this kind of Edward Bernays propaganda, this B.F. Skinner propaganda in the schools so that people follow whatever the authorities tell them. What is interesting is that the school kids, who are always by nature rebellious, at least I assume they are because I always was, <laughs> uh, I think that they are beginning to break away from this. They are beginning to smell that the propaganda is just too hysterical, too one-sided. And that doesn't work with kids. If you want to propagandize them, you have to be more subtle than that. Yeah. And these people are That's now it. so desperate that they're just telling lie upon lie upon lie on top of lie upon lie upon lie. Absolutely. And it isn't working. Well, People we're, out of, we're out of time, Lord Moncton. Thank you for pointing out the truth and keep it up. We will hear as well. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the InfoWars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happens. So check it out, InfoWars.com forward slash show.